Welcome everyone to the MOOC on Pacific Studies offered by the University of the South Pacific. I'm Dr. Shalendra Singh, Head of Journalism and Senior Lecturer at the University of the South Pacific. I'm your presenter for this session, which is on images of the Pacific in the international news media. Okay, with regards to the learning outcomes, we will discuss international news coverage of the Pacific and also analyze the many variables that drive and shape the coverage. This is to help us understand how the Pacific might be perceived internationally as a result of the media coverage and the effect also on the self-esteem of the region and its people. Let's begin with coverage of the Pacific by the international news media. The nature of the coverage is determined by the interaction of two associated paradigms. One paradigm is the global news flow patterns and the other is the news worthiness framework or how journalists define what is news that is what is worthy of coverage. Global news flow is a field of study in its own right. It analyzes the coverage of events in foreign countries including the flow of news from one country to another. A crucial determinant of news flow is the ownership and control of the communication channels. Technologically advanced nations own and control the tools for international communication. Up to 80% of international news come from only six major sources. And these six sources are Reuters, news agency, Reuters is a news agency, AFP, United Press, Associated Press, all these are news agencies, and then CNN and BBC television. In other words, Western news agencies are primarily responsible for the world's images of other countries. The control of international communication channels is reflected in the flow of global news. Various studies, time and again, show a huge global imbalance in the flow of international news. Least developed countries are the least covered. When these countries do get coverage, it's mostly about conflict, coups, and natural disasters. A study of the New York Times coverage of foreign news over 22 years has shown that one-third was negative news. Of this, 50%, the largest proportion, concerned the third world. Okay, so far we have discussed how the developing world is portrayed internationally. How then is the Pacific Islands portrayed? Okay, this is the next natural question uh, for us in this region. There are no specific studies on the Pacific. However, the trend we have seen so far and the anecdotal evidence suggest that the Pacific fares no better than other developing regions. Okay, the Sydney Morning Herald is a major Australian newspaper. A one-time editor has said that stories from the Pacific get low priority unless there is a coup or a disaster. Others in the field have made similar observations. For example, New Zealand's mainstream media coverage of the Pacific nations has been found to be less than 5%. Based on international news flow trends, it is conceivable that international media coverage of the Pacific is both scant and also skewed. Some Pacific politicians have for long complained that international coverage of their countries is lopsided. They feel that the media are merely entrusted in sensational crime, disasters and conflict. As we have discussed, these leaders may have a point. One research I have cited shows that out of ten news stories about developing nations, nine, if not all, are negative. So far we have established to a fair degree how the Pacific is covered, okay, and that is sparsely and one-sidedly. Which brings us to the question of why is the Pacific and other developing regions given such treatment by the media? In addressing this question, let's consider what communication specialist John Mitchell has observed. Mitchell writes that a misguided rule of the thumb 
four foreign correspondents, okay, foreign, foreign correspondents are people sent overseas to cover international news. So Mitchell says that a misguided rule of the thumb for foreign correspondents is all people care about is schools and earthquakes. This is quite an interesting statement and it is also quite revealing in the context of how media conceptualize and interpret what is news. Media use a framework to determine what is newsworthy. They gauge the newsworthiness of an event or issue on the basis of seven key elements. Let's consider the elements of newsworthiness individually. The first element, impact, refers to the number of people affected by an event or issue and to what extent. The greater the impact, the stronger the news value. The second element is timeliness and this means news has to be fresh and current. The third element, prominence, refers to recognizable individuals or entities such as the Prime Minister or an institution like USP which is well known throughout the Pacific region. Proximity means that to be newsworthy an event has to happen somewhere nearby. Human interest deals with people and how they live their lives. Conflict is anything involving fights or disagreements. The final element, weirdness, involves anything unusual or strange. To understand further why media portray the Pacific in the manner that they do, let's apply the newsworthiness framework to Pacific coverage and see what we come up with. In terms of proximity and prominence, the region is too small and too isolated to matter. Geopolitically speaking, the region is not that influential either. However, the Pacific is of news interest regarding impact and conflict, deemed the two most powerful news values of all. If conflict or impact are big enough, the region suddenly becomes prominent. So what we have is three major news values rolled into one. Uh, the three news values I'm referring to are impact, conflict and prominence. What happens is all of a sudden the region transcends the geographical divide as far as the news values are concerned. Hence, major impactful events in developing countries attract maximum coverage. Geography is no longer a barrier. Once a conflict or natural disaster is over, the region loses new significance. What I'm saying is that the international media, by and large, are less interested in rehabilitation or peace initiatives. So after a conflict or natural disaster is over, the international media will depart. Another question to ponder is, why do the media so such a penchant for bad news? Stafford explores this issue in his interesting essay. He argues that journalists are drawn to bad news as they believe it's more compelling and interesting. There is a famous journalism adage, bad news is good news, meaning negative news sells better. There is also an argument that attraction to negative news is ingrained in human psychology. Experiments by Trussler and Soroka showed that participants preferred negative news over neutral or positive news. So in theory, journalism is seen as a profession rather than a trade, with expectations to uphold the public interest above all else. What happens in, in reality is that market-driven media respond to actual audience demands, not idealize thirst for knowledge. As Posner argues, the media serve up what the consumer wants first and foremost. Given that conflict in the Pacific is a magnet for the international media pack, it's appropriate to dig deeper into this issue. Obviously, conflict is the staple of news reporting. It's often in the media's financial interest to not only report conflict but play it up at times 
because often the greater the conflict, the bigger the audience. Intense competition in ratings war among international networks have seen cases of exaggeration, even fabrication. Reporters are often forced to cut corners due to tight budgets and demanding deadlines. The effect is simplification, distortion, and falsification of news. Okay, this does not happen all the time, but it does take place more often than it should. Okay, parachute journalism, you might have heard the term before, also affects media portrayal of the Pacific internationally. Parachute journalism involves dropping reporters into crisis areas for short-term coverage without sufficient background knowledge. This is how most international news is covered. Reporters lack in-depth knowledge of the situation, so they report only the basic details. This results in misrepresentation of facts and ignorance of contextual issues. Deadline and commercial pressures add to the challenges. There was evidence of parachute journalism during the Spade coup in Fiji in 2000. Professor Stewart Firth at the University of the South Pacific at the time noted that the media did not convey the complexities of the coup but reported simplistically along ethnic lines. The slavish attention given to coup leader George Spade fueled the crisis according to Firth. Local broadcaster William Parkinson echoed Professor Firth's comments. Parkinson stated that the nature of the foreign coverage left Fiji in an extremely difficult situation once the crisis was over and the parachute journalists had gone. Let's now discuss the impact of the skewed coverage. Media has a powerful effect on people's view of the world. As discussed, positive developments are not considered newsworthy and may not be fully reported. If a situation doesn't make the news, it simply does not exist for most people. Many people do not realize that bad news gets priority because of drama. Many people do not realize that bad news gets priority because of its drama. The negativity can also become self-prophesizing and lead to low self-esteem. One-sided media portrayals also have implications for the economy. People lose confidence in the country, investment falls, and so forth. Still on the impacts of skewed coverage, scholars have come up with theories to understand the potential effects. Agenda setting recognizes that media play. Let's look at agenda setting to begin with. This theory or concept recognizes that media may not affect what people think but may affect what they think about through the choice of what to report. There's another theory called framing, and this refers to spin to the spin or angle given to a story. Frames may emphasize conflict over conflict resolution, for example. Yet another theory, cultivation, argues that heavy viewers of television may come to believe that the real world is what is similar to what is seen on television. So these variables could shape international audiences' perception of the Pacific, which is invariably negative. If you look at the way the Pacific is portrayed in the international media, as far as the studies we have just discussed go. Now, concerns about bias coverage are not new. Developing country leaders had been complaining, and their complaints prompted calls in the 1970s and 80s for a more equitable news flow arrangement. This movement was called the New World Communication and Information Order. The UNESCO mandated McBride Commission looked into these issues and made several suggestions. Two of the more controversial suggestions were that journalists should be licensed and it should be mandatory for developed world media to report developing world news fairly and consistently. But the Western critics were having none of it. 
They saw the proposal as an attack on media freedom and they rejected it outright. So the global news flow status quo was maintained. The current situation has not improved much, even though developing countries have made some progress. The establishment of national and regional news agencies, for example, have facilitated the exchange of locally produced news. But there is no firm guarantee of balanced reporting since the framework for defining what is news is the same. Social media has liberalized news flow with citizen journalism to some extent. But developing countries have control over only 10% of the electromagnetic spectrum. In the Pacific, challenging geographical conditions hinder bridging the digital divide. Okay, we now come to the conclusion of this presentation. Okay, what we have seen so far is that the developing world is both underreported and also misrepresented in the international news media to a fair extent. The skewed coverage is caused by lopsided global media ownership structures and also the global news flow trends. The framework for defining news is another cause of the one-sided coverage. The negative coverage is deemed damaging for the Pacific region. Attempts to balance the equation has seen only limited progress despite the emergence of social media. That brings us to an end. I hope you find the presentation useful and also interesting. Thank you.